Welcome to Isaiah chapter 47. This chapter is going in a little bit different direction than the last three chapters we've had. The last three chapters, we spent a lot of time contrasting who God is and what is idol worship. And the contrast and the, the choice that it, we are forced into to understand, do we prioritize God or do we prioritize idols, other than things other than God in our life, basically. Great advice, great teachings in those last three chapters. This is a message God is sending to the world. Basically, he's literally sending this to Babylon, but he's also spiritually or metaphorically sending this to the world, the people who are not willing to follow him. He has a message for you. He's still your God. He's still here to help you. This is the message he wants you to understand, basically. So let's get into this. Verse 1, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. Now just, just pause for a second right here, okay? Sit in the dust. If you're sitting in the dust, then you are low. You are on the ground. You are below the chairs and the thrones and tables and everything else. You are in a state of humility. And I uh, like he's, O virgin daughter of Babylon, uh, is really interesting. So this is getting into that. Uh, this can mean, virgin can mean young woman, not a woman who has never known a man, basically, is what they sometimes they'll say in here. Um, that's, it, it can, virgin, do, virgin, just if you look at the beginning earlier in Isaiah, I think it's Isaiah chapter 7, we talk about that, uh, the supposed prophecy of a virgin birth for Christ uh, didn't necessarily technically mean that Mary didn't have any intercourse. It meant that Mary had not given birth, basically, is kind of how it was. If you look back at the verbiage and translations, that's more of what it means. But go watch that video to, to learn more on that one. And so he says in here, There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. And I mentioned in the last chapter that women have such a role in understanding the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. God uses women's perspective and women's lives as a metaphor for understanding some of the really core ideas around the gospel. And Isaiah is, Isaiah is really a book written about women, basically. It's, it's understanding the gospel through a female perspective. Because the female perspective is using metaphorically to understand the, the challenges and issues and the things that are going on and the relationship with God and those things. It's, it's pretty interesting. So look for that in this chapter. You'll see lots of feminine references, basically. So we've already seen virgin daughter of Babylon, the daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. So if a woman's not being called tender and delicate, there's been some changes here, some big changes. In fact, in the Old Testament study manual, it says this chapter demonstrates as well as any scripture in the Old Testament, the extent to which Satan has gone to achieve his eternal lie. From the beginning, Lucifer said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. It's Isaiah 14. 13 and 14. As Zion is the spiritual offspring of the Lord Jesus Christ, so Babylon is the evil offspring of Lucifer, who fell and became Satan, the father of all lies. So this is, again, idolatry for the last days, is what this is getting into. So this is the, the, the message to the world who aren't following God, basically. So again, if you, if you are tender and delicate, you're probably a woman living in luxury. You're not slaving in fields. You're not washing lots of dishes and doing things. You have luxury if you are considered tender and delicate. I mean, that's, and that's what they're saying is Babylon's not going to be that anymore. Babylon is going to fall. <clears throat> now, literally, Babylon falls to Persia in Isaiah's future here, basically, but metaphorically, Babylon represents the world. So think, if you think spiritually on this chapter, Babylon is the world. The world wants to come across as if it is a glamorous woman with riches and wealth and fame and fortune and great stuff. And he's saying that that's all going to go away. 
the wicked world will be destroyed at some point, basically. Uh, verse 2, take the millstones and grind mill. Uncover thy locks, make bare the leg, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. So what this is talking about is basically becoming a servant. So you've gone from a woman of luxury to a woman of servitude, basically. Working like a servant and grinding the mill, as well as going to the river for daily water. That was the woman's job in the Old Testament times, is going to the well or going to the river to gather the water for the day. So when you uncover your locks, that's your hair, basically. But then when you make bare the leg, you're lifting the skirts or the robes up, up high so you can wade into the water to get your water out or across rivers and things. That's what's going on. So this is, this is Babylon going from a wealthy woman to being a servant, basically. Verse 3, thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance. I will not meet thee as a man. So this is this is God saying, I will not negotiate or compromise in this matter, basically. God will uncover the falseness and expose the world for what it is. That's the nakedness shall be uncovered. That Babylon looks like a beautiful woman that is all sparkled and dazzled and, and has the glitter and everything going, but he is going to reveal the truth. It's all fake. This is a fake woman, basically. It's not shiny and beautiful thing. <clears throat> In fact, he says here, when he talks about, I will not meet thee as a man, God will not deal with Babylon like a man would, or with emotions and passions that can be easily distracted by outward appearance. God's going to deal with Babylon the proper way, not as a man who can be distracted, who can be manipulated. Now, some translations would phrase this as, I will spare no man. That's it. That's another way to think about this, is that I will take vengeance and I will spare no man, basically, in, in his vengeance. Verse 4. Now, why, why? let me go back to this. Before we go into verse 4, why would God be so mad? Because there's a broken covenant. These are the people that are of the world. This is the wickedness. This is the people who aren't keeping the covenants. They're not repenting. They're doing the worldly stuff. They're doing the things that the world thinks is important, not the things of God. That's why he's upset. And it's not that he's suddenly going to destroy people. But the problem is, is because of the wickedness and the laws that God has decreed, that they will suffer for their consequences. And he doesn't like that. But he can't stop that. Because he would take away their agency if he did. So he's letting them suffer, basically. Because that's they, that's what they wanted, basically. Verse 4, As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. Now, now remember, if anybody ever says God is ethereal, God is unknowing, we can't really know who God is, say, well, Isaiah 47 actually tells us his name. If we can't know who God is, then why is he telling us his name? Go look at Isaiah 46. There's so much in there where God is saying, here am I. Here's my name. Here's how we're related. God wants us to know him. God wants us to build a strong relationship with him. That is abundantly clear as we read Isaiah. Relationship makes a big difference. And relationship is a feminine concept. It's, it's important for everybody, but if you realize that women are way more connected and, and think in relationship better than anybody else. So again, another feminine concept to understand we need to know God. We need to get to know him and understand him. Relationship makes a big difference. Verse 5, Sit thou silent, and get thee into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called the Lady of Kingdoms. <clears throat> so this is basically, go into obscurity. You're going into exile. Okay, The world will be ashamed as Christ comes. When Christ comes, everybody who's not keeping the commandments is going to have a bad day. Those who are keeping the commandments are going to have a great day. It's going to be a good time. But again, that's the choice that we get. Are you, in the day of Christ's coming, going to be happy he's here? Or are you going to be going, oh, crap, I need to, I need to, someone needs to hurry and delete my Facebook history. 
or my internet history or someone needs to to clean this you know i need to i need to change oh my gosh i got a whole big fat check of tithing i gotta hurry and pay you know or whatever it is it doesn't matter what it is the question is is are you going to be worrying about things that haven't been done yet or are you going to be glad that everything is ready and then prepared and in order so that he can come and you can accept him very important uh, also with this, as society is attracted to a beautiful woman, so the children of men are attracted to the glitter and power of spiritual Babylon. That's what he's talking about here. For thou shalt no more be called the lady of kingdoms. <clears throat> Babylon is that, that influence for luxury, for lust, for pride, for selfishness, for all those things that we see in like wealthy cities, uh, lots of sin and degradation. It's all about aggrandizing myself, basically. And what he's saying in here is that's all going away. That's not going to be around anymore. So here's, this is a good thing for us to think about because this is a message to the world. If, if you are not keeping the things of God, then these are things you need to worry about. If you are keeping the things of God, then this chapter shouldn't bother you at all. This is, this is a good contrast, a good thing for us to think about. Verse 6, I was wroth with my people. I have polluted mine inheritance and given them into thine hand. Thou didst show them no mercy. Upon the ancient hast thou very heavily laid thy yoke. Now this verse is really fascinating because what he's saying in here is, even though the world is sinful and lustful and, and all these, these artificial things, it's fake, it's hollow inside, it's baloney, but it just looks amazing on the outside that God gave his people over to the world, basically. He gave the world power over his people. <clears throat> and what happened? The world put a very heavy yoke on his people. They hurt them. Now, this isn't so much God saying, fine, you take them. I'm done with these, these people. I'm, gonna, I'm going to hurt them out of spite or nothing. This is because his people looked at the glamour and the glitz and said, I want that. I want what the world is doing. If you think of this, think of that. This is, Isaiah 47 is fascinating because Isaiah 47 is basically another, uh, uh, looking at the prodigal son story from a feminine perspective, basically. This is the prodigal son. The, the prodigal son said, I want what's, uh, the grass is greener on the other side. I want what the world wants. Give me my inheritance and I'm out of here. And then he left, basically. Not that God, not that his father wanted him to go to the world, but his father didn't stop him either because he let his son make his own choice. That's what he's doing here. The, Israel went wicked. Israel wanted to do what the world wanted to do. And because of that, the world destroyed Israel. The world hurt Israel bad. So he rejected them due to their sins. But what he's saying here is basically, you didn't win over Israel. I gave them to you because of their wickedness. I let them come to you because of their choices. <clears throat> so the world might be like, oh, look, we've taken the chosen people of God and we've corrupted them and made them bad and made them like us. This is amazing. No. God let them leave. The world had no power over them. God let them leave. And they gave themselves over to the world. This is the, if you think of Lehi's dream, this is the people leaving the tree of life and going to the great and spacious building. This is that same idea, that same concept. Uh, and th though the wickedness of Babylon may appear attractive because it is easier pleasurable, it only enslaves its subjects. It puts a heavy yoke on them. This is what the prodigal son found out. When he went out and partied, so long as he had money, Everybody liked him. When he ran out of money, nobody liked him because they didn't care about him. They cared about what he could do for them, like spend his money for their benefit. It's hollow. It's fake. When he ran out of money, nobody cared. So what happened? He became a slave. He was homeless. He was eating out of the, the trough. You know, they usually take all the scraps of food that nobody eats and they throw it out to the pigs to eat there. And he's, this guy's out there eating. He's starving so bad. He's fighting with the pigs to get food. 
And that's when he realizes my dad's servants, the guys who work hard and get paid little, do better than I am right now. Why don't I return and just be one of them? That's the prodigal son. That's exactly what this is in Isaiah 47. This idea of sin making us look like we want to go to the other side. They go to the other side, and then they realize it wasn't as good as it should have been. It was terrible. <clears throat> so that's what's happening here, basically. In fact, verse 7, he says, And thou saidest, I shall be a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things to thy heart, neither didst remember the latter end of it. So when you look at this, this is being, being I shall be a lady, or I shall be a mistress. I This is the world saying, I shall conquer all. I shall rule it all, basically. And what happened is she didn't, lay these things into her heart. She basically believed in herself. She drank her own Kool-Aid too much. The world drank its own Kool-Aid. It believes itself too much. <clears throat> she didn't think about the consequences of her actions. She ignored the reality and focused on her blind ambition. So she didn't remember the latter end of it. She didn't remember that there's still prophecy. There's still the word of God saying it's going to fall apart. It's not going to work. So boasted of being indestructible, but failed to see the judgment that would finally destroy her. In blindness, spiritual Babylon wreaks havoc upon the world, failing to see the self-destructive nature of her acts. Now, one thing that could we could look at this idea in here, <clears throat> when we think of this from a female perspective, and and please, ladies, correct me if I'm wrong on this in in the comments, but in a, uh, you know. Uh, women have a natural desire to look and feel beautiful. And I think that's very natural and innate. But it can lead to vanity. It can lead to an outward appearance and not an inward sustenance, basically. And that's this kind of, this theme, this idea, you know, women have a hard time believing in themselves, uh, but they will appear as if, their confidence sometimes, but inside they struggle. This seems to be a common thread, and you can correct me, ladies, if I'm wrong, or confirm it in there if this is common for, for this to happen to women. I think it is. Um, studies have shown that if, if you talk to a man, a man is willing to tell you the wrong thing and make it believe he's, make you believe he's right. Because that's, I think, kind of testosterone makes men do that. They just, oh, my opinion's right, even if it's wrong you know, kind of a deal, whereas women are not willing to be wrong. There's a wholeness to them. They want to have the outward and inward be the same. And what this is, is this is saying the outward, sometimes we get to that point where we're so outward, we forget to be inward. <clears throat> and that's what's, what happens here with the world. The world gets so wrapped up in its own party, it believes itself. Hey, I'm going to throw a party Hey, because I threw this party, I must be great. And so this is this reinforcing of itself, upon itself, basically, drinking your own Kool-Aid. And I think that's what's really going on with this. Um, <clears throat> verse 8, Therefore hear now this, that thou art given to pleasures, that dwellest carelessly, that sayest in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. I'm so looking forward, ladies, to the comments on this chapter. As you think of this chapter, these metaphors from a woman's standpoint, from a woman's perspective, what else do you see? What else do you think of when you when we go through this chapter? Because this chapter is definitely very feminine. What else does this teach you as you think of these concepts and ideas? What is the female perspective that we're missing? Put that in the comments. I'm looking forward to reading those. So in verse 8, this is again talking about being in the moment, giving yourself over to pleasure, being so in the moment that you forget there's a greater plan of things out there. I think women sometimes do that. They're so good at being now, they forget that now is still related to then and next. <clears throat> we don't think about the consequence of things. We just think about what's happening now. But it says in here that the world is going to say, I shall not sit as a widow. 
meaning I am not going to lose. I'm not going to experience loss. Neither shall I know the loss of children. <clears throat> Excuse me. we got bad air out there, and it's driving me, uh, it's drying me out. Edward Young said in his book, Book of Isaiah, he says, Another translation of this verse can be, And now hear this, O voluptuous one, the one sitting in security, the one saying in her heart, I am and none else. Because she is voluptuous and filled with wealth, Babylon speaks of herself in the most exalted of terms, which is women, female. As the true God, the Lord of hosts, had spoken of himself, I am the Lord, and beside me there is none else. So Babylon adopted similar language, frivolously deifying herself. This is Babylon. This is the world believing that the world is God, basically. Talk about making you making yourself the idol, not worshiping an idol. <clears throat> so Babylon adopt, adopted similar language, frivolously deifying herself. Here is the pinnacle of Babylon's pride. Here is the self-confidence of the kingdom that sought to oppose itself to and exalt itself above the kingdom of God. Sure of herself and of her position, Babylon had spoken in defiant terms giving assertion to her conviction that she would not suffer the two greatest calamities to come upon a married woman. To sit as a widow simply means to be a widow. In what sense may Babylon be said to have become a widow? The term would imply the loss of what is essential to her position as mistress of the nations. She who sits secure as mistress of the nations and is so confident in her boasting will be so degraded and fall so far that she may be compared to the married woman who has lost her husband and must live as a widow, as well as the loss of her children as well. So instead of saying, I'm, I'm indestructible, I'm impervious, I cannot experience loss, I just keep gaining more and more to myself, I am the God, worship me, I am the deity, there is none next to me, basically, I am the, I'm at the pinnacle, I'm at the top of everything, there is no... God's above me, basically. But that's going to fall apart. Now also in here, the Old Testament study manual says, the Babylon of the world is enthroned triumphantly when men worship the lust of the flesh. She becomes a counterfeit God. They deny the power of God, the Holy One of Israel, and say unto the people, there is no God. That's Second Nephi 28.5. And there is no hell, thus the devil grasps them with his awful chains from whence there is no deliverance. 2 Nephi 28, 22. This is the trick. It makes you feel good and makes you believe you cannot fall, basically. This is the building with no foundation, like Lehi saw. The great and spacious building that had no foundation. It looked as if it was floating. It didn't have a foundation. It wasn't secure, but it looked amazing and mighty and stable and strong. It appeared good, but it really wasn't good. That's the thing to always remember. <clears throat> so verse 9, But these two things shall come to thee in a moment in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. These things you said would never happen are not just going to happen, but they're going to happen quickly. How is the wicked going to be destroyed in the last days? Suddenly and quickly. You're not going to see it coming. It's going to just suddenly go, oh my gosh, it's here, it's all gone. It's going to happen so fast you won't even know what's going on. Like a disaster happening. Suddenly, your family is gone. A war suddenly breaks out, suddenly it's all gone. You went from living high to now you're humbled down. In fact, he goes on in verse 9, he says, They shall come upon thee in their perfection. For the multitude of thy sorceries and for the great abundance of thine enchantments. So not only is it going to come and come quick, but it is going to come in such abundance and so perfect of a way that you just, you don't even stand a chance. The kingdom that you have built up, the wealth, the pride, the falsehoods that you have built up are all going to crash really quickly. And there's nothing you can do about it. This is what waits the people who do not follow Christ. This is what waits for the people who are not willing to repent. This is what waits the people who make a covenant with God and then break 
the covenant with God, which is exactly what Israel did, which is why Israel was given to the world, is because Israel broke it and said, I want what she's got. You realize this metaphor that Isaiah is talking about in here of relationship. We've seen this all over. There is this relationship concept of marriage that he talks about. Christ is the groom. The children of Israel are the bride getting married. But now we see this other woman coming into the picture and the bride going, I want to follow this woman. I want to go that way and leaving. And the glamour, the glitz, it's amazing, it's powerful, it's so cool, it's equality, it's all this great stuff, it sounds awesome. I am leaving God to join the world. The prodigal son metaphor, basically. <clears throat> That's what's happening here. That's the concepts that we're learning in this. Now verse 10, For thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. Thou hast said, None seeth me. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted thee. Thou hast said in thine heart, I am and none else beside me. So again, this is that reiteration that, that the world, Babylon, is seeing herself as if she is God, basically. She is deifying herself. She trusts in the wickedness. She trusts in what she lusts and loves. None seeth me. Nobody knows the wickedness. Nobody knows what's bad. Haven't we all heard that in our life? Oh, one time. No one's ever going to know. You're alone. You don't have to. No one will ever know about this. Well, baloney, God knows about it. And it's being recorded in heaven in the book of life, like we learned about in the other chapter. So here's what's funny. Hugh Nibley said this, in fact, about this chapter here. He says, Babylon is at once restless and busy, selfish and carefree. She has all of the technical and commercial know-how at her command. All the experts are working for her, the charmers, the astrologers, the expert analysts, the skillful accountants, and all will be burned as stubble. That's what, what he is talking about here, basically. Uh, you think people don't see you, but they do. It's baloney. People do see you. Uh, in fact, another thing he nearly said was Babylon has, oh no, sorry, I just read that one. Uh, this is uh, out of the Old Testament study manual. They say the Babylon of the world through wicked covenants and deeds, binds a man's loyalty to the princes, the prince of darkness, by the promise of secret gain. It's a secret combination. The Babylon of the world assumes expertise in all knowledge and decrees that men should worship at her door. As men embrace this hellish doctrine, they begin to believe that they know where others do not, and they become self-appointed gods, even to the giving and taking of life. Oh, the vainness and the frailties and the foolishness of men, when they were learned, they think they are wise. And they hearken not unto the counsel of God, for they set it aside, supposing they know of themselves. Wherefore, their wisdom is foolishness, and it profiteth them not, and they shall perish. That's 2 Nephi 9.28. So this is that same idea of this concept of dealing with... Um, Perception, perspective. Are we taking the right perspective of things? This is the world believing in itself so much it puts itself as the expert in its own self, basically. <clears throat> and then verse 11, Therefore shall evil come upon thee. Thou shalt not know from whence it riseth. And mischief shall fall upon thee, or misfortune, basically, that thou shalt not be able to put it off. So here's the thing is, the, it'll happen so fast. The wicked is going to slowly build and build and build and get more wicked and get more wicked and get more wicked. And then suddenly it's going to fall. And it's going to fall so fast, they won't even know what happened. They won't even have time to think about what's going on. It will collapse and fall apart. They won't know what to do. In fact, it says, and desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. They have not seen destruction like what will befall Babylon. Physically and spiritually is the wicked world. Basically, it's this is something that has not yet happened to the scale that is going to happen. So again, we know this is going to happen. We know the righteous who stand in holy places, who can go to the temple, who can be in those righteous areas, 
will be saved and less harmed by the destruction of the last days. We know the wicked world is going to just suddenly come to a collapse and it's all going to fall apart and there's nothing they can do about it. The only question is, which side are you going to be on when the music stops? When it all happens? That's the only question that you have to decide. That's the only thing that you have to think about. Do I want to be in holy places? Do I want to have the worthiness to be in those holy places? Or do I want to be over here and party and have fun? You have to decide. This is the whole dynamic of life. You decide where you're going to be, basically. You know both sides are there. You get to choose which one. That's what the whole point of this world existence is about. So verse 12, stand now with thine enchantments and with the multitude of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. If so be, thou shalt be able to profit. If so be, thou mayest prevail. So they're saying in here, basically, you, you know, try to get yourself out of it with your own powers. Take your enchantments, take your sorceries, take the stuff that you have thought you believed in and see if it helps you get out of the mess. Good luck by the way. That's what verse 12 is. Now verse 13, thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. So again, this is this idea of there's, you're trying to save yourself using your own ideas and your own logic, and it's not going to work. It's just a bunch of talk. It's baloney. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. So using the stars and the moon to predict fortune and trials is what the prognosticators are doing, basically. And he's saying here, with so much going on, our, your experts won't know what to do. There will be confusion. There's nothing. They don't even know it's coming. They can't save. They can't save you. They won't be able to at all. There's nothing you can do. Except make a different choice. Repent, let Christ take your sins, follow him, put him first in your life, prioritize him and let him lead. Follow what the spirit is telling you and stay close to the spirit. That is what you can do different. And if you do that, then you don't have to worry about chapter 47 shouldn't, shouldn't worry you. Chapter 47 should be like, oh, I'm glad I'm not going to feel that basically. Uh, verse 14 Behold, they shall be as stubble. Now, stubble is, the, is a little bit of the weeds and grain that's left in the ground after they've harvested and they cut the weeds down. Stubble is what's left, basically. So they've been cut down. They've been humbled and destroyed. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor a fire to sit before it. So this is really interesting that the fire will burn them. They are the fuel for the fire. They are not, the fire's not there to bless them. The fire's there to destroy and curse them, basically. They won't have comfort because it's not, it, that's not what the fire's there for. It's a comfort to help them, basically. It's destroying them. So, and this is that, again, thus shall, this is what's going to happen. This is the Lord has decreed this. Verse 15, thus shall they be unto thee with whom thou hast labored, even thy merchants from thy youth. They shall wander every one to his quarter. None shall save thee. There it is, folks. The wickedness of the world will be destroyed. God has decreed it. He has told us it's going to happen. And he said it's going to happen in a way that you will not know it's coming. It's going to be swift. It's going to be sudden. And you won't even have a, you won't even be able to react to it. It'll happen so fast. Like, kind of like an earthquake hitting or a tornado hitting. The only way to be ready is to prepare in advance. And the only way to prepare in advance is to be worthy to stand in holy places. Everything else is getting destroyed except for the standing in holy places. God will protect them. You have to make the choice. You get to choose. There's the contrast. You can see it clearly now. You choose. Do you follow God or do you follow the world? That's what everything in life adds up to. Everything in life is all about that. So I hope seeing this contrast in this chapter as well as the last three chapters dealing with, with who God is and idolatry 
helps you see this contrast. Helps you see that the whole point of what Isaiah is telling us, that God is telling him, is here's the future, here's what's coming, here's the choice that you have. You get to make the choice. Your thoughts and your actions will continually belay out which choice you make. Now, the beauty is as long as you're alive, you can repent. So even if you choose to go to the world side for a bit, you can still come back. But the problem is, is if you leave this life and you're still over here, I don't know how easy it is to get back. That's the hard part. So in this life is the ultimate opportunity to make that choice. Do we follow what God wants? Do we repent? Do we give up our sins? Do we stop doing those dumb things and follow what God says? Even if it doesn't make sense to the world, we still follow what God says. Or do we do what the world says? We follow the world's logic. Well, you can't follow both. You're going to follow one or the other. This is that dynamic, that contrast in life that we always have to think about. So pay attention to these things. And thank you for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. Like the video, share it out with more people. And let's jump to the next chapter of Isaiah as we continue to move forward in understanding the profound teachings that Isaiah has for us.